Genesis. I thought I'd find one easy for you to find. First book of the Bible. We're going to look at Genesis 12 and the uh, verses 1 through 4. And of course, as you guys are getting used to by now, you know we're going to be in a lot of other scriptures as well. But our main text will be Genesis 12, 1 through 4. Praise God, we have so many children in the church to look up and have the congregation just went out the side door. <laughs> what a wonderful problem to have. Isn't it though? Yeah. Wow. A promise is a promise. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is one of the, one of the first, not the very first, but this is one of the first of what we call messianic prophecies. He's talking about the Messiah himself will be coming through this line. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from the Lord. What a cool thing. God just says, bam, here you go. I'm going to make, I'm going to bless you immensely. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. And you will be a blessing to everybody else. So what did Abraham do that made him worthy of one of the greatest promises of all Scripture? What did he do that was so impressive to God? When you and I were kids, there was a saying we'd often hear, right? I'll say the first half and see if you know the second half. Cross my heart and... Oh, God. What was that child saying? They were saying that they made a promise. And if they were to break that promise... They would expect something horrible to happen. The original phrase even went a longer, a little longer, right? Cross my heart, hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye. I, I think that, because to a kid, the only thing worse than, than dying, because they couldn't even comprehend dying, was having a needle stuck in their eye. And I, that, I would like that. I tend to agree. That would be a horrible thing, right? But I think what we learn from that is that kids understand the importance of promises. And in fact, as parents, we learn to be very careful what promises we make to our kids. As my kids were growing up, I learned really quickly that if I told them that I was going to do something for them, I was going to take them someplace, I was going to get something for them, and then for whatever reason I failed to do that, you know what they'd say to me, Dad, you promised. You prom You can't not do it. You promised, Dad. <laughs> and as children, though, we learned that promises were important. And we learned that no matter what, they needed to be kept. God understands this. This is one of those things where we're told so many times in the scriptures that it would be better if we would have hearts like little children. That we could be more childlike. Not childish, as some people get that confused. Childlike. Understanding how important promises are. That they're important. That they need to be kept. And God understands that. So he has repeatedly told us, all throughout the Bible, that if he makes a promise, he's going to keep it. And in the Bible, one of the most significant kind of promises that God made, they were called covenants. A covenant was the kind of promise that God made with Abram. He changed his name to Abraham. And God promised Abraham that if he left his home and he took his family to a place that God would show him, God would bless him in several significant ways. But look at what God was asking him to do. Now, we read about this and it just takes a sentence or two and it doesn't seem... But understand, pick up everything that you know, leave everybody that you know, Everything that you own, go to a place that you are completely unfamiliar with. Now, a lot of us like to go on vacation, and we go someplace. But when you go somewhere, 
And then definitely, if you were going to relocate your family, wouldn't you do a little bit of research into where you're going to go, what you're going to do, what it will be like there? But see, Abram was not able to Google the place where God was sending him. He knew absolutely nothing about it. Keep in mind that in this time, there were still a lot of people that thought that the earth had edges and that you could step off and just, you know, fall into oblivion. If it's that far away and nobody's ever been there. You don't know what it's like. You couldn't research it. So this took an incredible amount of faith on the part of Abraham's part. Some people think that these Old Testament covenants, that they were like modern day contracts. And that's kind of true, but covenants are like contracts on steroids. <laughs> I mean, they are serious. Because back in the Bible days, folks talked about cutting a covenant with someone. And when you think about cutting a covenant, you would think, well, does that mean they took a piece of paper? You know, maybe they cut it in half? No. If you cut a covenant with somebody, you made the agreement, and then you literally took an animal and cut it in half. And, and the parts were placed a few feet apart, and it created a path between the two pieces of the dead animal. And, and then the parties who made this covenant would walk between the parts of that animal. And they were essentially saying, may I be like this animal if I do not keep up my part of this deal. Genesis 15 describes how God cut his covenant with Abraham. The Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite to each other. And when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared. This represented God. And it passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. God was declaring to Abraham, may I be like these animals if I break this promise. It was God's way of saying, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Except God's covenant with Abraham was not child's play. This was extremely serious. I mean, basically, the fate of the creation hinged on Abraham following these directions because through his line the Messiah would be born. It was God's way of saying, I will keep this promise. And this is important to us for several reasons, but two that I want to look at today. One is that whenever God makes a promise, he keeps it. He intends to keep it, and he does. It was God's way of dramatically driving home how serious his promises were and how committed God how committed God is to intentionally fulfilling these promises. How committed he is to doing what he promised he will do. In the book of Isaiah 46, 11, we read, What I have planned, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. In other words, if I said, if I said it, I will do it. If I told you I'm going to do it, I will. And in 2 Corinthians 1, 20, Paul tells us, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Simply put, God will keep his promises. Have you picked up on that yet? His promise here in Genesis 12, all of these promises, these had to be incredibly exciting to Abraham because it's life-changing, right? It should be exciting to us as well. Because Abraham was not a man who was much different than you and I. Now you think about it, when he was 75 years old, I sort of feel like I'm 75 today. <laughs> Starting to look at too, I hear you. Every time I'm spending time with Rick ages you, so yeah, I'm probably doing that. True story. 75 years old, and scripture says little about anything he had done prior to that. He's not known as a great warrior, a great theologian. He's not much of a writer because he never wrote a book of the Bible. Did you ever read something from the book of Abraham 14 too? I used to get the kids in youth group and we did this Bible drills. 
I'd ask them to look up the book of Abraham. They would just, they would they'd frantically sort through the Old Testament. It was hilarious watching them. And, uh, <laughs> but he never read a book of the Bible, but yet he's one of the greatest men of the Old Testament. I mean, only Jesus and maybe Moses are more highly regarded in Scripture than Abraham. But what did he do that was of such great importance? I mean, Moses led the people out of, uh, out of Egypt and he you know, wrote five books of the Bible, the Ten Commandments. All. What did Abraham do? Well, the answer is right here in 12.1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. That's it. That's what he did. He was spoken to by God and he listened. He obeyed. God asked him to pack up his tent, go to a place he'd never been. So Abram did exactly that. He packed up his tent, he put his wife on the camel, and off he goes. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10, it tells us that by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in a promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents like Isaac and Jacob. They were heirs with him to that same promise. And he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. That, because that's it. When God says move, he moves. Okay, doesn't sound particularly impressive to me, to be honest with you. I'm sorry if I'm being blatantly honest. He simply did what he was told. I grew up having to do exactly that. I got whacked in the head, right? <laughs> do what you're told, and he, and he listens. He obeyed. But God sets him up to be one of the most amazing heroes in all of Scripture because he moved. Why is this so impressive? It wasn't so much what he did, but why and how he did it. You see, Abraham was a man who believed God. He trusted God. He had faith in God. And Romans 4 and 9 tells us, Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. His faith, not his actions, his faith. Anyone can obey, but he believed in his obedience. And that is what should excite us. Because the reason this should excite us is because of what it really means. We don't have to be important in this world for God to use us. Amen. We don't have to have an impressive resume for God to want us to work for him. We don't have to be strong or smart or rich or powerful. All we have to do is trust God. Believe in God, have faith in God. 2 Chronicles 16.9 tells us, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. All God wants to know is this. Or rather, all God wants us to know. Do you trust him enough to let him work in your life? Will you let him lead you where you want to go? Will you let him completely remake you so that he can use you? I heard about this guy. He was complaining. He had recently retired. He was one of the CEOs of, of a large um, aeronautical company. And he had been hired years ago, right out of, right out of college. He graduated from Purdue University. And when they hired him, they told him something like this. We're glad that you graduated from college. It proves you're a responsible, committed young man. But as you may well know, there's nothing they've taught you that will help us. We're going to have to retrain you with all the skills you'll need here. He went to college for four years. He studied hard. He faithfully attended all his classes. Yet virtually nothing he learned had really mattered. In the same way, it doesn't matter what strengths you think you have. It also doesn't matter the weaknesses you feel you may have. It doesn't matter how skilled, how clever, how rich, how powerful you think you are, because those things 
do not impress God. God isn't looking at your resume. God does not need us to do anything for Him. There's nothing any of us individually or collectively can do that God simply can't do Himself by just wanting it to be that way. God is looking at whether or not He can trust you to do what He wants or go where He wants you to go. All God wants to know is this. If He asks you something, will you do it? Do you trust Him enough to go where He sends you and do what He asks? So the first thing that God's covenant with Abram should teach us is this. If God, make a, if God makes a promise, we can trust Him to keep it. And faith is when we trust God to do exactly what He has promised. I come across a verse, Romans 4, that I never really noticed before. And in Romans 4, 21 and 22, it said, Abraham was fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God had the power to do what he had promised. That's what it's all about. Do I believe that God will deliver on his promises? In fact, that's exactly what 11.6 is saying. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith is believing that God will do what he promised to do. And this covenant with Abraham is the covenant of the Bible. All the other promises, all the other covenants, they seem to hinge upon the guarantee that God made to him. And there were a lot of other things. God promised to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. God is saying, I'm going to take care of you. I've got you. I am the one who will take care of you. People will curse you, and people will bless you, but I've got your back. I heard one Bible college professor say that this promise was only for Abraham. And it puzzled me, and, and as we tend to do when we start to dig into the Bible, we find the truth. And the truth was that guy was wrong. Because Jesus said, if anyone gives even a cup of water to one of these little ones, because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Matthew 10, 42. In other words, I will bless those who bless you. Paul wrote, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. In other words, God will curse those who curse you. God will bless those who bless you, and he'll curse those who curse you. Now, while I caution you to catch with those scriptures, okay, is do not use that as a point where, well, I can't wait till God gets them back. <laughs> and it's tempting in, in, in our carnal state to say, this person did me wrong. The Bible says I'm not supposed to seek revenge. Oh, but I can't wait till God gets him. <laughs> That's when God hangs his head, saying, you're missing it. You're missing the whole point. Yes, let me deal with that person. But you aren't to root for them to fail. Understand, guys, you and I have the same promise. The same promise that God made to Abraham, he made to you and I. It was made because God knew that he would experience trouble in this world. And God wanted to drive home the fact he loved this man so much that he would protect him. One of the worst things that a Bible teacher or a preacher or a fellow Christian can say is they tell people, God will never give you more than you can handle. And when I hear that, I ask them for that scripture. Because it's not there. God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But we're told throughout the Bible, God will consistently give us more than we can handle because we need to understand how badly we need Him. Amen. God will drive it home to us over and over again that it's in our weakness, we can see how strong God is. Amen. Jesus tells us Christians, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, 
I have overcome the world. Same promise, same God. And God makes this promise to us because we, like Abraham, are now covenant people. We are people that God has made promises to. So why are we a covenant people? What makes us so special? God makes us promises like he made to Abraham. Why? What, what is so great about us? Nothing. It's because of Jesus. Amen. It's not about us. Because it's only by the blood of Jesus that we have any promises from God. And this is, goes to the heart of what I want to really drive home to you all this morning. The promise that God made to Abraham, back in Genesis, it ultimately pointed to Jesus. In Galatians 3.16, Paul writes, The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture doesn't say, and to seeds, meaning many people. But, and to your seed, meaning one person. That's Jesus Christ. You see, Abraham was chosen by God to be the beginning of a long line of descendants that ultimately led to Jesus. When, when I was a much younger man and I wanted to study the Bible, one of the things that I did not see any value in even studying at all were those genealogies. I would find them so boring. And and I understood, and actually I was even taught by some, by other Christians and, and teachers that you really don't have to even look into them. Those are more for the Jewish people because they love the genealogies. And Matthew was a gospel that was written primarily for Jewish people, and they, they really love that. You know, they just like to keep track of, of their families, and it's important to them. But it really doesn't mean much to us. Man, was that so wrong? Uh, there is so much in there. There's so much value. Because in Matthew 1, 1 and 2, it says, A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it goes on, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. God began Christ's genealogy with Abraham. He set up a paper trail, if you will, for Christ. It was a paper trail that began with Abraham, but was re-emphasized over and over again to Christ's mortal ancestors. If you really want to have some fun, take that genealogy in Matthew 1, and take a Bible concordance or something, or just Google it on your phone now, and, and find out a little bit about all those people who are mentioned. And what I love about it is there are some really rough around the edges people yeah. in that line. People that were far from perfect. Certainly not stellar individuals. And God used each and every one of them. People who were broken. People who went through horrible things in their lives. People who had bad things happen to them. People who brought bad things upon themselves. They still ended up in that same line. God used them. The promised Messiah was coming through that lineage. And this was not accidental. This is a deliberate paper trail. So why is that important? About 500 years before Christ was born, a man named Siddhartha was born. You ever heard of Siddhartha? You know, it was Buddha. Right? Centuries before Buddha was born, nobody ever said something like, he's coming. There were no prophecies about the birth of Buddha. No one ever prophesied that a man like Buddha would be born, that he would live, that he would die as he did. And nobody ever said these will be his parents, his grandparents, his great-grandparents. Buddha just popped up in history, he taught the things he taught, and he became the founder of one of the world's great religions. 500 years or so after Christ, a man named Muhammad was born. And guess what? Nobody ever said someone like Muhammad is coming. Nobody ever prophesied that a man like Muhammad would live and teach and die as he did. Nobody ever said these will be his parents, his grandparents, his great-grandparents. Muhammad, like Buddha, they just popped up in history, taught the things they taught, 
became the founder of our great religion. But by contrast, look at Jesus. When Jesus was born, there had been centuries of prophecy about how he would be born, how he would live, how he would teach, and how he would die, and how he would rise from the dead. And Abraham became the linchpin of a long line of descendants that ultimately led to Christ. And that long line of descendants is one major proof that God had planned this whole thing out. Mm. This was not accidental. That long line of descendants is one of the things that those of us who really love um, Christian apologetics can point to as proof that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. All of the prophecies that the Jewish people claimed had to be fulfilled for that person to be, be the Messiah, guys, every single box is checked. Amen. Every single one. Amen. And the odds against that happening are incredible. The odds against that happening are greater than any of us winning the Powerball. Someone once said if you took, I forget how exactly it goes, but if you were to take quarters and stack them and cover the entire state of Texas and you would mix in one gold dollar with that, the odds of somebody just reaching, walking through and picking up that one gold dollar are equal to any one person being able to fulfill all of those prophecies. It was God's paper trail showing that Jesus was not just another religious leader. That he was the one sent by God. Now one more thing. You guys always love that. You never believe anything. Um, the promise given that the promise given Abraham, it didn't just point to the coming of Jesus. God's promise to him, it pointed to the foundation of what Jesus came to do. Because in Matthew 1, God makes the genealogy of Christ start with Abraham. Why not go back to Adam? After all, Adam was the first man, right? Or why not go back to Noah, or one of his sons, because they had to restart the human race after the flood. God kicks off Christ's genealogy with Abraham. He picks up a guy born maybe 300 years after Noah dies. Why, this? Well, why would he choose Abraham to be the start of this genealogy? Because as we stated already, there's nothing that Abraham did that impressed God, nothing that Abraham did to deserve God's promises. He was not chosen because he was a great writer or a soldier or a prominent theologian or a powerful leader. There's only one reason God chose Abraham. Romans 4.9 Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. He was chosen because he was willing to trust God. And it was his willingness to believe God's promises that made him impressive to God. Isn't, wouldn't you love, if I could pick anything in my life to be, it would be impressive to God. Amen. When you think about that, how could there be anything greater than to be impressive to God? I remember as a child growing up, and when I got, I got too old to be spanked, I found that my parents had an ace in the hole. That they could slide that phrase in that was worse than the beating. Son, I'm very disappointed in you. Mm. Oh, it would crush me. I'd just say, just beat me. It was the beating, you know. Dad didn't hit me that hard. A few whacks on the butt, I'd go on with my life. It was over. Oh, but that, son, disappointed in you. Oh, that, I, that would, oh, I dragged. That would last for days, that pain. But to be impressive? Think about that, guys. His willingness to believe God's promises made him impressive to God. You see, God made Abraham the central focus of his promises because he wanted us to realize centuries later Jesus would not save us because of who we were or because of what we'd done. Jesus would only save us because of what we believe. He did not come to save the righteous, but the lost. He came to heal the sick, not the ones who thought they were well. 
Romans 4.13, it says, It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise, the promise that he would become heir to the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Abraham was important to God because his only claim to fame was his faith in God's promise. You see, too many people, they, they get the impression that God will be impressed by them. They believe that God will accept them because overall they're generally nice people. And, and even if they haven't always been nice, at least God will accept them because they've done more good than they've done evil in their lives. And they believe that if they can do a little more good than evil, they can balance the scales out just enough so that they can come before God with enough on the good side that he won't, he won't be able to keep them out of heaven. <laughs> if they can just get that done, they believe that God will not be able to keep them out of heaven because their own self-righteousness has bought them a place in eternity. And because of, they've done one one more good thing than evil thing, then the creator of the universe is totally helpless and has to allow them in. Oh, wow. <laughs> and God says that doesn't work that way. God was going to save us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the rebirth, the washing, the renewal by the Holy Spirit, as it says in Titus 3, 5, 6, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. The only way you and I make it to heaven is through the blood of Jesus. Amen. And we stand only by the promise of salvation through Jesus. Amen. Centuries ago, thousands of Jews stood outside the temple courts and they heard a man named Peter confront them about their sins. And his sermon was so convicting that they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter replied in Acts 2, 38 and 39, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise, that's not how it is a promise. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. That's us. For all whom the Lord our God will call. All right, us, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this promise. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. For giving us the, your mercy that even gives us the ability to obey you when you call Dear Lord, we pray that we would come to have a greater appreciation in our lives for this gift that you've given us. And not only, Lord, would we have that appreciation, but we would have it in such a way that we cannot bear to not share it with others. Heavenly Father, we pray that this gift that you have given us will be one that we will be us incredibly driven to share. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.